Our esteemed speaker this evening has over 20 years of industry experience. Please welcome the CEO and co-founder of Scream, Ami Gal. Hi everyone, thank you for uh, dropping by. I have a flight to catch, so I uh, will have to scram uh, later on. Uh, but I wanted to share with you why we started this uh, GPU database uh, adventure. And later on, uh, our team will show you some stuff we do with the product and a little bit about GPU database. So we have here Joel, right there, uh, Matt, Crystal, and Armand, and they are more than happy to answer any of your questions. Yeah, great team. <laughs> so, a few years back, uh, me and uh, another guy, we were uh, looking at the GP GPU uh, algorithm, uh, playing a little bit with uh, algo trading and other stuff that was done uh, back in the days. And I thought and he thought it's going to be cool to have a Cartasic product running on a GPU on a data set that is big, bigger than the memory stuff of the GPU. This is how we started. We thought it was going to be cool to do a join on a large data set bigger than the memory of, uh, of the Tesla that we used at the time. And, and, and uh, that was it. Hmm. So uh, the idea is that CPUs are progressing linearly in the last few years. I don't know if you noticed. Mm -hmm. And GPUs have been known to be very good with game video rendering, game rendering, and some GP GPU applications. But doing a simple join on a GPU, I can tell you that not even one investor wanted to invest in this uh, <laughs> startup. In the state. Everybody told us we are crazy, funny thing. <laughs> IBM did a due diligence on us, on us. That was in 2010. And I met this professor uh, that was part of the team who wrote the chess algorithms of uh, Deep Talk. I don't know if you guys remember. It was groundbreaking at the time. And he looks at me and I'm telling him uh, what I want to do. And he tells me, you know that my thesis is uh, about that it's impossible to do uh, the other product with uh, uh, multi-core uh, chips, GPU. So we didn't pass the due diligence uh, with this guy. So a few years later, GPU processing is more than the standard data crunching uh, techniques. And you see a lot, of company, uh, a lot of companies coming up. You mentioned a few of them. There are a few more coming with even newer chips, and, um, and we're going to show you a little bit out of that. The company uh, was founded in uh, Tel Aviv, in Israel. Um, our, uh, uh, we have sales and operations in Asia, Asia Pacific, uh, Europe, and uh, we decided that our headquarters were going to be in New York. And usually for Israeli companies, 95 percent of the enterprise companies are going to the Silicon Valley and we thought New York is cooler. Cool is a, is a key thing <laughs> in the way we uh, decide how to do stuff. And we uh, <laughs> New York is cooler. So uh, we started at, uh, I don't know if you heard the name, uh, uh, Silverstein, uh, Silvertech uh, uh, Ventures. So uh, Silverstein, the owners of the World Trade uh, Center, um, and complex, they have a special accelerator, accelerator for companies that are doing groundbreaking uh, technologies. Uh, and we sit at the World Trade Center with nice use of the Oculus, uh, the Pools, and the Freedom Tower. So uh, we may have a meetup there as well. It's cool to be there. And um, uh, this is our headquarters and the uh, spirit of our operation. So I'm more than happy to share. Our uh, our uh, adventure with you guys, and just before I move over to Ornon uh, to show you some stuff about GQ database and some things we do, uh, we are in the business of very large data sets, right? So for us, data sets that are below uh, what used to be a very large data set, but today not so much. Uh, database that are below four terabytes 
of raw data. They are interesting, um, but whoever works with them, but this is not our business. We started trying to break the barrier of the memory of the GPU, and this is what we do. We are working on data sets that are growing, and they are much more than eight terabytes. We have clients with one petabyte doing genome uh, analysis, and we have clients between 300 and 330 terabytes and 300 terabytes. And this is where we are looking for partnerships <coughs> and for uh, applications that we can collaborate with. <coughs> right, so thank you very much for coming over. I know I was much more boring than the swag, but <laughs> anyway, I know. Thank you. I'm sorry you have to hear me instead of him. He's a little bit more entertaining. Um, the meetup title is a bit of a mouthful, so we have a short acronym. It's much easier to say. Um, so I will say this ahead of time. We have a bunch of people here, uh, Joel, Crystal, Matt. And we will offer free consultation to anyone who finds this interesting. So if you think this is interesting, this is for you, then come talk to us and we will offer free consultation and we will help you identify if this is right for you. Um, so I'm, I originally had Ami slides, but I've changed it to mine. So I'm from Israel. Um, I've been at Scream for four years. Uh, I originally started as part of the dev team. I worked on the SQL compiler. And um, I tweet about animals a lot, if that's your thing. Animal gifts, uh, dogs, that is my thing. Um, I'm also a huge airplane nerd, so I might tweet about that as well. Just, you know, fair warning uh, if you're going to follow me. Um, a few uh, months ago, uh, The Economist came out with this you know, article, I just took the image from there because I think that's, you know, everyone likes the images, right? No one cares about the text. Uh, and they said Moore's Law is ending. And you can see, really, you know, the clock speed. And the clock speed around 2005 sort of peaked. And I'm sure you all remember you, you would have these 400 megahertz CPUs, and then 500, 600, 800, 1000, 1500. And that sort of stopped around 2005. You would get 3 gigahertz, and it doesn't really go above that. I mean, some situations, if you like overclocking, not recommended uh, for servers, by the way. Um, so CPUs have sort of peaked, but Moore's law is not ending because we're still adding more transistors, right? And that's what the law is about. It's talking about more transistors. But instead of making the clock speed faster, we're adding more cores. And Intel sort of started that with the Core 2 Duo, where you would have uh, two cores in the same die. And I think in most of your phones, if you all have iPhones, you probably have like six cores. Uh, some have eight, um, but in essence, this so this is a quote from a Microsoft guy, and he said, the consensus was that if we could keep adding cores and we could reach a thousand four CPUs, we would be just fine. Um, everything would be fine, sorry. Didn't memorize that right. But it turns out that's really, really hard. And he's a chip expert, so he should know what he's talking about, right? Um, so, the thing is, when you add more cores, you say, let's just make things parallel, right? So you have each core doing their own thing. Um, and that works well in some scenarios, but it's not true for everything. Not everything can be parallelized. And there's this thing, they call it uh, embarrassingly parallel. Embarrassingly parallel means it's very easy to do. It just it sort of begs that you make it parallel. And that's not true for everything. And that's not true for data processing, for databases. Um, so let's talk about data for a second. Because unlike CPUs, which have sort of peaked, um, data has not. It's still growing, and it's growing exponentially. So what was the norm in 2010, which was, let's say, 10 terabytes, that's no longer the norm. We're talking much more data. And this is a problem when you want to analyze it. Because we're in the petabyte age. And petabyte age means lots of data. So it's no longer you know, one, one and a half terabytes for a company. A small company might have <coughs> tens to hundreds of terabytes. And we're in talks with companies like that, and we're saying, we can't afford these really, really expensive solutions. We have, we, hear, we know about all these, but we can't afford them. And you might not be Google, right, with 15 exabytes. But what if you could get Google's type of solution, right, for a lot less? You don't want to pay Google's. You don't have pockets as deep as Google, I hope. If you do, we should talk. But it's it's a problem, right? It's a problem for a lot of companies, and you know, NSA estimated 12 exabytes. That's a lot of data. Um, 
So the question is, are we only analyzing the tip of the iceberg? So unlike global warming, the icebergs are getting bigger. And they're getting bigger mostly underground because your, your CPUs are not getting faster and your data processing solutions are not getting faster. So maybe we, think we need to think about something else because we don't want to be in this scenario because the Titanic can crash into this very easily. But this, they're likely to avoid. And there's a bear on there, which means maybe he scored. I don't see any food. Yeah, I hope he doesn't start. Um, so, you know, we need to lift that iceberg up. And this is not a realistic iceberg because half of it is above. But, you know, we're not into iceberg realism. We're talking about data. Um, so, that was the problem. Now let's talk about what we're, what I'm going to talk about, really. So, why GPUs? Um, what are GPU databases? what we do, uh, when are they good, and the future. So, uh, I'm sure you all know GPUs. You might not know that you know GPUs, but you know them. They're, they're used for gaming. This is not a very new game, but you get the point. It's in everything. It's in your mobile phone. It's, uh, it's in embedded devices. It's in, your, in some of your cars. If you have like a collision detection system, you might have GPUs there. Um, NVIDIA are really strong at um, uh, Self-driving cars, Tesla have a partnership with NVIDIA. Um, not just Tesla car, we'll get to that in a second. Um, so what is a GPU? A GPU is a processor designed basically for display functions. It's designed to render video, render games, um, and basically show it on the screen. It's got a processor, which does most of the work, and it's got memory, just like a standard processor. But like I said, it's designed for graphics. It's designed to display things on your screen. For our purposes, I'm going to talk about GPGPU, which is pretty much a GPU. I'm going to use the term interchangeably because GPGPU is annoying to say. Um, a GPGPU is a processor, a graphics processor, that does not do display uh, type activities. It does specialized calculations, like what we do in databases. Um, you know, it's just generalizing it for non-graphics. For That's pretty easy to say. Um, AMD and NVIDIA both have their own processors. Um, I will say this up front, Scream is mostly, uh, exclusively NVIDIA for now. Um, we don't know what the future of that is. Um, they're both advancing. AMD have Rockham. That's their CUDA alternative, if you've heard of CUDA. I'm sure you have. Um, then that's their alternative. And it's up and coming, and we hope to see it advance. So, let's talk core count for a second. Does anyone know how many cores this thing might have maximum? 18, 16, 30, 24, Okay, um, I heard 30. 30 is close enough. The actual answer is 28. That's the maximum these things go. Intel, Xeon goes up to 28. With hyper, with hyper threading, you might get 56. You might have two of these in a server. So that's 112 cores. That's not bad, 112 cores. Pretty impressive. An NVIDIA Tesla P100 from last year will have 3,584 cores. I remember that number correctly. I'm proud of myself. 3,584 cores. Now granted, these are not the same as, in, as Intel cores. They're much simpler, they don't have the same caching, branch prediction, all that stuff. But 3,584 cores is a lot, and you can do a lot with that amount of cores. Should I move over here? I think you guys are looking there, not right here. Um, so GPUs uh, used to be a strange thing. They're no longer strange. You can find them pretty much everywhere. Um, Many hardware manufacturers, Dell, HP, Cisco, they all manufacture solutions with uh, NVIDIA cards. Um, they're pretty much on the cloud everywhere. I'm going to move here. I think that's okay. um, They're on the cloud everywhere. Azure, you know, Alibaba, uh, Amazon, Bluemix, Google, they're everywhere. They're even on Oracle, right? I'm not going to say anything. Um, so let's talk for a second about how GPU acceleration works. because. You can't just throw a GPU into the problem. You can't say, oh, I'll just stick a GPU and it'll make everything fast. You have 3,584 cores, great. Let's run everything on that. It doesn't work that way. It's just not that simple. Um, in reality, you have to take a bunch of operations that you can parallelize and offload them to the GPU. So you still have a bunch of CPU code. You still need the CPUs. But the GPU is sort of used like a math coprocessor from uh, whoever remembers back in the day. Um, so about 10% of our code that's green is uh, GPU-oriented code, uh, stuff that, does, that you know is easily parallelized, and we push that over to the GPU, and everything else remains on the CPU. 
So, what are GPU databases? Now we get to the real interesting part. Um, so a GPU database is either relational or non-relational. We like relational, we'll get to that in a second as well. Um, that uses a GPU to perform some database operations. Um, we're typically seeing GPU databases as being directed towards a, uh, like a, an environment that's been oversold on Hadoop for analytics. Um, a lot of people think Hadoop was designed for analytics. It really sort of hasn't been designed for that. It's not too good at that. Um, there have been a lot of products that have been aimed towards analytics on Hadoop. Um, and we think they're not doing too good a job. Um, Hadoop is excellent for what it's designed to do. Analytics, not so much. Um, so GPU databases are also typically pretty fast. Um, but they're not just disrupting, let's say, the in-memory database crowd, which is you know, designed for fast analytics. Um, they're also good at processing different types of data or processing a lot of data, like huge quantities. And that's really what we want to talk about. So why GPUs and big data? Really, it's about you know, getting that big core count to do a lot of operations, to, do, to really punch through that huge amounts of data, perform these repetitive operations, and database operations, like joins, group buys, you know, order by, these kinds of database operations work pretty well on the GPU. Um, we can also talk about it for cryptography, which is what the GIF was about, but we'll get to that in a second. So, database market. There have been a lot of new databases, and I know you're saying, why would you make another database? And the answer to that, I mean, pretty much talked about it. It's, it's a pretty crazy idea. Um, there have been a lot of in-memory databases, because memory is cheap. And you know, these are just a handful. And some of these are GPU databases. They're also in memory. Uh, I don't want to talk about them too much. Um, but in-memory databases sort of struggle around that two terabyte range um, because hardware is not typically designed to do more than two terabytes. So what they do is they scale out. And when we're talking about scaling out these already pretty expensive hardware, we get to very, very expensive solutions. Um, SAP HANA, for instance, which uh, granted, is one of the more expensive solutions. To handle 40 terabytes, it will cost you about $22 million for four years. And that's not my number. That's a number from a company that actually bought that. Okay, So that's not even the list price. That is the actual cost. So that's a lot of money, especially for a small company. So GPU database. There's more than one type. Uh, there's the in-memory GPU database. Uh, Mapke and Kinetica are uh, big in that realm. Um, they're good for you know, shaving that query down from, a, um, let's say, a second and a half to 500 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds. And they're very good at what they do. Um, our type of GPU database, Scream, is more designed for big data. So we're not going to shave your query down from a second and a half to, you know, to 500 milliseconds. We're going to take it down from hours to two minutes. Okay, And that's where we see the future. And I'll talk about the future in a second. But I, I think that's important to say we're not about the millisecond range. We don't care about that, personally. Um, uh, and we think that that's the future because if you remember, I showed you data is growing exponentially. You need something to handle that data. And in memory is not going to be able to handle that without scaling out and becoming really, really expensive. Um, so we say don't buy the hardware, buy the results. Okay? You don't need to explain what a GPU is to your boss because your boss doesn't care. Okay? He doesn't care what kind of chips are in the server. He cares about the results. And we think you should you know, really examine the database based on the results that it gives you, based on what it can uh, give you from a business perspective. If it can give you uh, faster queries, if it can give you access to more data, that's really where we see it uh, shine. Because no data scientist has ever said, you know, give me less data faster and I'll give you more accurate results. That's not a thing. Okay, well, I haven't heard of it. Maybe you have. I don't think it's very common. We think the more data you're, you analyze, the better off you'll be, the more accurate your models will be. So I'm going to show you a few stories, um, specifically from our customers, but because that's what we know. Um, so we actually have a, a big telecom out in Asia. And they were looking to do analytics on their customer base. They have 40 million customers, which is not a small amount of customers. It's, it's pretty substantial. And they just did not have the ability to really get a holistic view of their entire network, see where their customers spend time, where they work, where they, where they live, where are they you know, Instagramming more. And they really wanted that ability. 
Um, so they came to us and they said, you know, help us, help us do this. And we wanted to achieve all. And that's actually a live, uh, not live, but that's a recorded dashboard from one of their, uh, one of their solutions. And it's difficult to say, I don't understand the language, it's a very difficult language, but you can't mistake their face when they suddenly see this and they say, holy crap, you did this, you gave us this solution. I'm sorry for the person. Um, you gave us this solution and they, they say, okay, click that, click that. I want to see more, expand the time frame. I don't want to look at five days, I want to look at 10 days. I want to see how, where our people spend our time. I want to see what they're exposed to. Are they looking at our, our competitors' billboards? We want to know this stuff. And we gave them that ability. And that is interesting because we were up against a Green Plum database, uh, which is not bad. It's a pretty good database. It's Polymer. Um, is it okay? Can you see the numbers? Yeah. So the ingest time was 20 minutes for screen versus 300 uh, minutes for the Green Plum, which was already pretty impressive. And the query time was also knocked down from two hours down to 10 minutes. And they didn't believe us. They had they went row by row, value by value to compare it because they didn't believe that this was actual data. And they had, they had us run it on different dates and different numbers because they said, there's no way you weren't re-aggregating this because that's what we do on Greenplug. This is why it takes so long. And you were just running that on raw data? Yes. Have any sense of the scale of the data we're looking at here? Um, um, in nodes in a sense of so this is six terabytes in this situation. I'll show that in a second. Because that's the important bit. The amount of hardware they needed to do this in two hours, run that report in two hours, was pretty big. But with Scream, we, we took one of their old boxes and we added an NVIDIA Tesla card. That was a $4,000 investment from their side on hardware. And 96 gigabytes of RAM. They would not budge on that. We wanted more, but they said, this is what we have, use it. And we were pretty happy with the results. They were pretty happy with the results, and uh, uh, I would say that's a that's a win. Um, this, um, so this is six terabytes of data. That's not really big. They are expanding the project. That that was like the, the beginning of the project, just to so, show them how this works. And this was done in four days. So start to finish of this project was four days on site. Uh, I'm going to show you another one. Um, this is against IBM Natiza, which is a pretty formidable opponent. It's very fast. It's also, as you know, extremely expensive. And we were doing something called an ACB calculation, which is a retail uh, type of calculation that really looks at the entire retailer across the entire country. We can't name this company because they threatened us very severely if we did. Um, and this is something that they ran. We did not run this ourselves. They ran this test. And they gave us these results, and we matched Matiza, which was very happy for us. It was a very happy moment. 24 terabytes of data, um, 300 billion rows joined with eight separate tables, uh, you know, tens and hundreds of millions of rows in the other auxiliary tables. They're too small to mention compared to 300 billion rows. And once again, it's sort of the same story. You're, I think you're getting the point here. Eight Matiza servers compared to a single Dell box with iSCSI attached storage. And that's where we really see GPU databases shining. Because this was done on raw data. We didn't pre-aggregate. We didn't have to create manual indexes. The GPU is just really good for that. It helps us compress everything. It helps us tag metadata. It helps us do uh, reverse lookups, uh, inverse lookups to find out where not to look for the data. It helps us with the join. It helps us with the order by, with the group by, with the disking. It helps across pretty much every SQL operation. And I think the cost of ownership here, once again, speaks for itself. It's a really, really big difference. Um, one more thing, one more uh, scenario, which we've actually done with a company out here in the US, which, once again, no name uh, for, for our own reasons. Um, they were doing trillions of ad impressions. They're an ad tech. And they were trying to calculate bidding histograms. They're trying to get the most out of the data that they have. And they started out with something like 85 terabytes. And they said, you know, show us that you can do this on 85 terabytes. And we started out with a single server. And they were very happy with that. So they expanded that. And now we have eight Tesla GPUs uh, working to really get that workload uh, ready. And that's compared to their HBase slash Phoenix solution. So they were used to querying uh, HBase uh, with Phoenix. It would take them about five hours to get the results, which is, it's a, it's, it's a lot of time. And our solution was able to do that in five, which is why they expanded it. Um, and that's pretty cool, I think. Uh, 
because that's a lot of data. And this should advance, and it does something. All right, let's see an action real quick, shall we? So I'm showing Tableau because a database, when you look at it, it's like, you know, my colleague Jill says, it's like opening the tap in your house, opening the faucet. You see water come out, you're like, okay, it's a database. I get it. It does calculations. So we're actually using live mode for Tableau here. And live mode is interesting because it doesn't let Tableau do anything. It pushes all of the operations down into the database. So everything we do here sends a query down to ScreenDB, one or more depending on the situation. And ScreenDB does that in the background. So what you saw here was a four table join on a data, sets that, on a data set that is 33.6 billion records, which is not that big when you think about it. The reason it's not that big is because this is a demo and we want it to run you know, within milliseconds slash seconds because you're not gonna wait like, like that, like that uh, you know, publisher company did. You're not gonna wait five minutes for a result. Um, so ScreenDB basically takes all these queries from Tableau and runs them in the background. And this is raw data. So the second the data comes in, because it's tagged, because it's compressed, and all the GPU databases do this, right? They compress everything because that is an expensive thing to do, copying data to the GPU and back. That's an expensive operation. So you want to compress everything down as much as you can. And this database, uh, these databases really allow you to access more data than ever before. You're not just looking at a billion records. You're looking at 300 billion records, in this case 33, but you know, 300, 500, 900 billion records pretty easily. And that allows you really to, for the first time, and this is not doable with any other database, not at this scale, uh, really deep dive into your data, ad hoc query everything, look at, uh, you know, ask whatever you wanted, because until this time, you sort of had to think, okay, am I going to anger my DBA if I ask him to add another index to that column? You don't need to do that here, not with any GPU databases. We all avoid indexing, and that's pretty cool, I think. So one more thing, and this is a genome uh, scenario that we have. Um, this is a little bit different. It's not our classic use case for screen. But we actually had a bioinformatician in our company. We still do. Um, she developed this very interesting way of handling genomic data in SQL, in a relational database. And we sold the solution to a big research facility in Israel. And they were used to doing, let's say, a handful of people. They were used to comparing a handful of people uh, from like someone's ethnicity to find if there are you know, similar anomalies in their genome to understand, is this person more likely to get a specific illness? It was mostly done for cancer, but other illnesses as well. And they were used to doing that in about two months. So they would compare six, seven people to one person in about two months. That's a lot of time to wait. And the person waiting, they know they gave their DNA, they're waiting to know if they have some genetic condition. That's a long time to wait. And with ScreenDB, they, they're actually, this is one of our smallest installations from a GPU perspective. It's only two GPUs, because they only have two people running queries against the system. But this is our largest installation in terms of data. This is a one petabyte solution that we installed for them. And they're able to now analyze hundreds of people within minutes, within hours, sorry, not minutes, hours. So, I mean, hours is a long time, but it's nowhere near two months to wait. Imagine you're going in, you give your DNA, they run this analysis, and within two hours, you have your result. And we're not making a lot of money off this thing specifically, but we're okay with that because this has the potential to change people's lives. And this could affect people that you know. So that's why that's why we're doing this. Even we're sort of losing money on this one. Um, Chanel might say that server racks are fashionable. They had this thing mm -hmm. last year. Um, our customers, they don't really like server racks. And we say, be efficient with your hardware. If you can take a single server, stick a GPU inside, or a couple of GPUs, or four GPUs, depending on, you know, depending on the chassis, and you can do so much more with that. And a typical ScreenDB installation will, with two GPUs in one of these boxes will be able to handle about 40 terabytes. That's efficiency. That means you can do so much more with so much less. And that's that's really, you know, everyone's talking, do more with less. This is it. This is where, where things get interesting. And it's you're thinking, okay, that's that's a bit scary. We don't want to change your database. But it's it's compatible with everything you already have, right? It's in the end. It's standard hardware. The only hardware requirement is a GPU, and it has 
for our case, it has to be an NVIDIA GPU. That's not true for all GPU databases, but we just found that CUDA is the most um, advanced platform right now, so we're strictly on NVIDIA for now. Um, and you can connect any storage to it, as long as it's mountable in Linux for us, we can use it. And scale out is just as easy. Just add more compute nodes as your workloads get more elaborate and more complicated. So let's talk about the future, because until now I talked about the present. Um, so the future, you know, I don't want to say, um, you know, change your database right now, because that's a scary thing. That's sort of why we say let's let's look at it together. That's why um, we're offering this thing. Let's let's look at it together. Let's find out if this is the right thing for you. It might not be. It's not good for everyone. Um, but changing GPU, uh, changing changing databases is a scary thing. It's right there in the scary zone. It's not cold fusion, right? It's not something completely out of field. I have no idea where this landed upon me. But it's not really incremental either. It's it's a little bit different. But in the end, it's SQL. You know SQL. It's it connects with the standard stuff, JDBC, ODBC, .NET. That's you know that as well. It connects to all your standard stuff, all your BI tools. No no big, right? Um, and we think this has the power to innovate your entire data pipeline because you will no longer be cutting down on your data. I said earlier, you know, no data scientist has ever said, give me less data. This is your opportunity to give them more data. Um, and the way we see it is a GPU database will be good for some things. It's not going to be good for everything. You will still have your Mongo. You might have your document store. You will still have your transactional databases. That's fine. We're not going to replace everything. Um, but we think there's a place for that, specifically for customers who need, for companies who need more data. Because these databases that are able to scale and are able to handle more data will be the ones who end up being relevant. And the ones who are stuck in the one, two terabyte range, they're going to end up being less relevant for a lot of use cases. Not for everything, there's still going to be a place for them, but they're going to be a little bit less relevant. The rising GPU offering in the cloud is a big opportunity for anyone who doesn't want to pay upfront for the GPUs. You already have pretty much every cloud provider, as I mentioned before, has GPU instances. You can just go on, pay for you know on demand a couple of dollars per hour and get a pretty strong GPU instance. You can also pay for spot. Uh, it's a little bit more economic if that's your thing. Um, you know these uh, per hour are pretty expensive. Um, but they will allow adoption by so many more people who can just spin up an instance, try it out, it's good, they continue it, it's not good, you just shut it down, and you don't even have to buy your own GPU. From a hardware perspective, um, we are seeing very interesting things, um, both from NVIDIA and from AMD. They're really advancing their stack. AMD with Rockham have come a really long way from just you know OpenCL um, slash whatever they have, to Rockham, which is very, very close to CUDA in terms of performance. And NVIDIA have really advanced their CUDA platform, and it's really easy, relatively easy, let's put it that way, to write good performing GPU code. It's not as difficult as it was in the past. Uh, I'm not saying anyone should do it. It still requires some work, uh, but it's a lot easier today. The faster the GPU gets, the faster that we get, and not just us, not the Kinetic or the others, we will get faster as the GPUs get faster. And it's not just the GPUs, it's the PCI Express. With PCI Express 5.0, it's expected to be very fast. And NVIDIA already has HBM2 uh, memory in their GPUs, which is very, very fast. It's got pretty intense bandwidth. And it's not just NVIDIA. Intel partnered with AMD. This, I think this is from last week. They partnered with AMD to create a single chip that is both CPU and GPU together and that's going to be pretty interesting. Uh, we're, we're sort of waiting to see how that plays out before we jump on that bandwagon. But that's supposed to be pretty interesting. And that's going to make everything fly. Um, reminder again, we will offer consulting to anyone who finds this interesting. And I want to finish on this slide again, um, mostly because I like the monkey gif. Um, you know. um, but also, these are pretty good points. Um, your boss doesn't care about the chips. You don't need to sell GPUs to your boss. You need to sell the solution. You need to tell them, or you know, if you're the boss, then you tell yourself, right? But if your boss cares about this, you need to tell them what a GPU database can do. Not, you know, the GPU can be really fast because that, that no one cares about that. Um, and you should evaluate it based on what they do for you, not what they do for anyone else. You need to evaluate it for yourself. 
see if it's good for you, and only then keep going. Don't don't buy into these technologies uh, before you try them out. Um, I think that's it from, from my perspective. I'm open to questions. Let's start here. Yeah. That uh, use case that you came up with for uh, uh, Tableau. Yeah. They were just doing the joint and the database. Yeah. So because we ran in live mode, all the operations were not done by Tableau. Tableau was used strictly for the visualization. Everything is offloaded into ScreenDB through the ODBC connector. You get, for, for that dashboard, there were eight separate uh, sheets, and each sheet generates its own SQL query, which is fired into ScreenDB. And that specific server has four GPUs and uh, 128 gigabytes of RAM, just as a, sure. if that's interesting. Yeah. 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 I don't know how to compare that to Google Big Table. It's a it's a different product. Um, I, I don't I don't know how to answer that. We've not we've not tested against Big Table specifically. We typically our our scenarios go. We enter a specific customer. They have a problem to solve. We help them. Either you know either they end up going with us or not, depending on on what their what their you know future looks like. Um, but we, we evaluate based on customer scenarios. We don't just go and generate our own data and say, you know, it's faster in this TPCH uh, scenario, because that's that tends to be a little bit misleading. Uh, that's what we found. I'm sorry, I can't answer that any further. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you uh, give, uh, give us a more details as to what the database there set is uh, very good for your, your system? And I want to conversely, what is bad? Uh, to use in your system? Okay, um, so the best type of yeah. stuff that we deal with, so we're a columnar database. So anything that fits in a columnar database would be good, as long as it's mostly uh, numerical and let's say relatively short uh, strings. So if you're analyzing blobs, clobs, whatever, um, not the ideal solution. If you have images in your database, you want to do some stuff on base support, not, not our strong suit. Uh, we're good at numerical, and we're good at a string, uh, sh relatively short string operations. Does it matter whether it's a uh, double position or single position? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it, uh, it doesn't matter because yeah. the double position take more bandwidth or something. Yeah, it, it's just you have the amount of you know items that you can push into a GPU in a certain uh, in a certain clock, but it doesn't matter for us. Okay. In, in so the what's, what's bad to use your system? I'm sorry. What's, what what means is not good? To use in, in this long text, basically long text or binary operations, not not the ideal situation. Before we take the next question, I want to remind everyone we are giving away this drone in a few minutes from now. Actually, if you have not already put your business card into the bowl with this guy who's been holding very patiently for a long time, please come up here and put it in. The bowl is going to sit here on this chair. Uh, put your business card in there. If you don't have a card, you can write on anything as long as it contains your full business card information, including contact info. Put it in your card. We'll uh, give that drone away in a few minutes. And let's take the next question. I'm going to go like this if that's okay. Oh, I'm just following up. Okay, sorry. I'll, I'll alternate. That's a good idea. Uh, this, again, this is, this is towards a mechanical concept. Uh, apart from like equity joins and low cardinality columnar searches, how do you? Work with these, like trying to do an as of joint, where you're trying to like, uh, find the first one that's just shorter, that, that, that is less than this, or something. I don't think we have a specific solution for that just yet. Um, we have, so you know, we're a small company. We're we're just over 40 people. There's a there's a limit to how much we can develop in one go. We were really sort of like for the first five years of the company, we were focused on building something that we weren't embarrassed to show our faces with. Um, we're building it as we go along, and it's typically based on our customer demands. Um, so if we talk to someone and they say, we would really like this feature, we would develop it for them, but we wouldn't go ahead and do it. So that's something that's a little bit different. Every SQL is bad. Yeah, I, we don't, I, 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 we've not heard that from a customer yet. If that comes up, um, I'm sure our architect will find something to do with that. He's pretty good at that. Nothing just yet. So alternating. Yeah. You know, Tableau actually issues multiple queries at the same time. Correct. So, did you is that is that actually without turning that off? Because you can actually turn that off. So it's like no, it's query. it's multiple queries. It so. fires off multiple queries uh, because we have several GPUs. We can answer more than one question at, at the same time, 
and they run simultaneously. Is there a limit on the number of queries you can run at the same time? We typically like around one and a half queries per GPU simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, for convenience sake, we can we can split that up in several ways. Yes. Um, the question I believe I posted earlier. Uh, when you implemented general SQL queries, you're looking at joins and nested thing. I mean, it can be complicated or not so complicated. But you're kind of voting on optimizer for query physics. But there must be some queries you kind of just leave on us on the on the GPUs. You have to go to sort of a pipeline. I can't go into that. We have a lot of players. Uh, we have a lot of things going on. Most of our really interesting things are actually in the compiler or in the SQL compiler. Okay. So it's a lot of compiler. It is a lot of compiler. We we do something in the vicinity of 300 to 400 rewrites to a query where we convert it to an equivalent form that would run better on the GPU. For several layers, it's it's pretty complicated. Yeah, I. But it's it's still impressive. I mean, I said, wow. Okay. Yeah. And that's just a small example because the big ones I can never really wrap my hand around. And that one was kind of hard. And you can imagine how difficult it is to test as well. Right? Yeah. You're testing huge data sets. You're like, how do I generate this in house? Yeah, that's it's the thing. I was thinking about generating test cases. This is the job at his company, whatever it's saying. OK, it looks like it's only but it's the case. It's difficult. The results are accurate. Yeah. It's not easy. If it was easy, everyone would do it. <laughs> Anything from you? Yeah. I'm a little confused here because I get the impression that most most of this exciting, interesting material is not for 99% of us in this room, perhaps even less. But I'm sure that there's a big audience out there and an audience who can use it or consume or and use it, use it. Do you see a point where this is obviously for our desktop type of equipment that eventually if we get to Actually, yes. So we, we do have an implementation on ARM, on ARM processors. So NVIDIA have something called a, um, a Jetson, which is uh, ARM 64 based with uh, a GPU on top. We actually do run on that. So I don't have any benchmark to show on that just yet, but we do run on that. And that's, that's part of our vision. We do want to get down to that so that we can say we're analyzing data on the endpoint, and we're only sending back the analyzed data instead of sending back everything. Don't send raw data. Do the analyze. Do the analysis at the endpoint, and only send back the analyzed. Many other things can be used to the benefit of improving health information or other things. Autonomous cars, airplanes, anything you can. You really want to collect information, and you don't have that that space. 100%. We're that's that's part of our our vision. I didn't put it in the future because I'm we don't know if it's the future or not. But it sounds like the future. Maybe we'll see. You know, the big thing thing about is as the Ron said, if you're using let's say even you're getting really good and you're using 10 terabytes of data, maybe you're branching of uh, an AWS or between the dupe and small, and you have 100 terabytes. Maybe said small companies can collect that. You're now analyzing 10% of your data. Your predicted and prescriptive analytics should be pretty good. But now, many companies have petabyte data. If you got really good and you invested a lot more money and you got to 20 terabytes, you're now analyzing 2% of your data. And uh, it's probably, you're okay. maybe you're okay, maybe you're not, but you're not getting better. So when we see companies saying we're gonna be in exabytes in a couple of years, even if you just go to 10 petabytes of data and increase and say, well, double again, we'll get to 40 terabytes, you're now down to less than 10% of your data. And you think your analytics are getting better, but every data scientist will tell you it is not. We're going in the wrong direction. So we're looking to change that direction. And uh, 
saying, you know, American businesses, if you want to get ahead, then if you can do better predictive and prescriptive analytics for causation and correlation, you're going to come up with better insights than your competitors. Just like what Amazon did to the retail industry by being data oriented. That's something to think about. Yes. Yeah. So you said that this is a lead room for all services. So yep. if I want to, if I have a use case or if I'm participating in foundation, which is a use case, no have 10 terabytes, I can found it on AWS and everything. I want to build, I have a use case, I want to show that how fast it is on the basis. Also, the other thing is that how this is useful for real time, like streaming. And some say that there are some applications which will do the analytics at that point rather than storing the data. Doing the analytics when the real time the data is coming and then storing the aggregated data. So, so how does this work in real time analytics? And how can I find this thing on AWS if I want to pick use case or competition there? So the first question is how do you find that on AWS and use it? You talk to Crystal, you talk to Matt, they'll take care of you. It's not in the public marketplace yeah. just yet because we're still we still like to control that, make sure that you're getting a good experience. So we like to make sure that you know and understand what this is good for because we don't want you to start using it and, and say, this is not what I was looking for. Why I spend time on this? This is terrible. So we like to help, you know, in, in facilitate that process. For this moment exactly, this is going on the marketplace very soon, probably within a month. How about the real time? You think rather than stored data, if I'm getting something like IoT or streaming, I want to do analytics at that point of time and store the analytical analyzed data. So that might not be in our, you know, in our core competence. We're good at taking large amounts of data and analyzing them. If you're talking about getting this data in and analyzing it as it comes in, um, you might be better off with something else. Now, if you have, though, we have a customer who's got a large database. Uh, and they are in that ad tech play, they care about 30 days. So if I bring in you know, 50 to 90 terabytes today, and that's day, uh, you know, 32, then I'm gonna roll off the 50 to 90 terabytes. And as soon as that gets in, it's available for query. If you add another column to your database, you can still work, 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 and then you burst that in, and then it's available to be part of the query. So speed to insight on very large data sets can be cost efficient in the back proposition. Yeah. You mentioned uh, an IBM that's using use case up there. How do you do on a 10 or 20 terabyte uh, aggregate uh, with table scan? And however your answer is, why would you be whatever your answer is? Um. For a full table scan, we will be faster than the TISA. And the reason for that is we do a lot of compression already. And we have a very interesting mechanism of, of handling how we copy data back and forth, uh, which is, like I said, a trade secret. Uh, but the compression really plays a really big part in that. And the reason for that is the GPU is really good at compressing and decompressing. It's essentially a free, op sorry, it's essentially a free operation for us. So we don't care if we compress everything as it comes in and we tag it as it comes in. And so this is not true for a full table scan, but if you're only looking at a specific part, our negative index will know, you know how to pinpoint that exact data. Are you saying you, uh, are you saying you actually process data compressed or do you have to compress it? Um, depends on the query. Some stuff we do uh, operate on compressed data. It's, it's gonna depend on the query. Yeah. So once you do your query, your data framework, it doesn't matter how you do the predictive analytics if you want to use sparse analytics. Yeah, you just, you know, you pull the data out, you query it, you pull it out, and you do whatever you want with it. That's, it's, just a, it's just a database, right? In the end, to the end user, it'll look like just a standard database. They don't need to know there's a GPU behind it. They don't need to know how much RAM there's in the machine, how many cores, they don't care. They care about writing the query, running it, getting the results. That's, that's true for this situation as well. Large companies who invested in the terabytes and the teasers and so forth, and they start to move users off into a in memory and the new combination. And the first thing they say is, what happened to my performance? Why can't I get it like I did that? We were spending 10 million on that box, spending a lot less here. It's kind of the future. So, this is a way to bring 
that kind of performance and get more scale. Yeah. Are you guys going to sit essentially as a sole purpose on top of GPU performance increases, or are you looking towards optimizations at a system level, for instance, for block IO? In other words, if you're in a, in a big database appliance, a part of this the database appliance, you may look towards optimizations where you're really thinking about I.O. as well as computation. Or you could use a commoditized I.O. scheme, like whatever the operating system or the file system or whatever it is. Or you could look towards systems that parallelize I.O., for example, in scenarios like that. So are you guys in that business, or are you just going to sit on top of kernel cores and uh, OEC? Right now, it's a lot based on the operating system. We do have some custom stuff, but it's it, it, we're a software company. We don't care for the hardware. We don't want to do like direct RDMA from the kernel. I, we're not really in that field. We're software, and whatever we can get from the operating system, and you know, working cleverly with the operating system and understanding you know the limitations and the opportunities that are to be had from this, um, we will use the operating system to its full extent. Um, we're, that being said, we're not um, we're not completely oblivious to all these new improvements that can be done with you know special hardware and, and you know special calls and doing custom stuff. We're we're looking into that. For the most part, it's mostly um, on top of the operating system for now. Just a follow up question: yeah. Do most of your use cases sit on top of solid state or a spinning disk? Um, it's about half and half actually. It depends on the situation and what the customer is trying to achieve. If they're looking to cut costs. We can work on top of a spinning disk. We don't care. Um, if they're trying to get more performance, we will we will advise an SSD. But the customer is the one who buys the hardware. Essentially, we recommend they buy it. You see the derivative of any sort of sign up the derivative in terms of what I think for SSDs. Uh, I'm ready to go. I'm not sure how to answer that question. Okay. Yeah. Are you guys looking to embed your analytics as part of your database? Yes, we are. Okay. There's nothing. In the database right now, they can allow you to do like a you know, like machine learning like inside. Right, like instance. we have R inside of SQL now, and that's kind of like the trend. Yeah. Microsoft yeah. has so many resources to put well, on okay, embedding R. Yeah. That's, that's a bit of a... a but I'm just, I was just wondering, because it sounds like uh, you yeah, would so have an advantage in that space. Yeah, we're, we're looking into it. We have, some, we have some interesting things coming up. Nothing public just yet. Okay. I okay. think I can talk about it. All right, I got it. Okay. Probably you can use Spark from the way you're winning your synthesis. Well, that, but that, that's what I see. You can do differentiate. You know, you do the net synthesis. Yeah, pretty much. It's right there. We're waiting. We're waiting to see how that. You know, I have to move it. But I can use it inside, inside Python. Yeah. Connect them, right? Yeah. Just through a standard connector. JDBC. I would recommend JDBC specifically for R, but yeah. Just lower, a little bit of lower overhead. Got a question then? Yeah. Do you prefer uh, a few fat nodes or do you prefer more thin nodes? What's your preference? Depends on the a lot of GPUs on a node, you know, or you know, you can go to a 16 XL on AWS, for example. Yeah. Or do you prefer to have double, triple, quadruple, thinner nodes? What's your preference and why is that? It's going to depend on the situation for the customer. If they have a, a whole lot of users querying the system at the same time, we might go for a higher GPU count. If they're just interested in getting more data and they only have a handful of users, we will go for thinner nodes and just better storage. Does memory matter? Um, it does. We will use whatever the system will have to offer. I mentioned we work on top of the operating system. Everything we can gather from the system, we will use. Um, it's it's there are configurations, right? You can set it, but. By default, we will use whatever we can get. The more RAM you have, the better. But there's no like specific uh, requirement that says we need one terabyte of RAM. That's that's not a thing for us. We have time for one or two more questions, but I just want after those two questions, we're going to give away a drone. So if you did not have a chance to put your business card in here or something else like this guy cut out half a plate, um, <laughs> and a business card out. If you have not done that yet, put it in now so you have a chance to win this awesome drone. Um, last one or two questions. You had your hand up? Someone in that region? You did. Okay. Have you tried running a really big iron? Like what? You know, big super. Uh, no. Maybe. We don't. We don't have the resources to to do have that. You, have you? 
consider talking to one of the big defensive sign shops that are maybe set up Bob with as a test run? We're something really big. We're in talks with some very interesting uh, companies doing, you know, big and small companies doing very interesting things with uh, expensive hardware. Um, that's not typically what we like to do because we like to keep costs down. We like to be accessible. We want it to be used by anyone. So we're not at the point where we're writing like specific code to handle, like on a Cray computer. I don't remember. They still think. Yeah. Kind of. So uh, we're not writing specific code to be handled on, on supercomputers because we, we would like to stay accessible. That's that's part of our, our value, I think. Um, having said that, given the opportunities, and there are a few in the pipeline, we, we are open to testing. And, and we, we've actually recently ported to IBM in Seattle. That's not like supercomputer, but it's pretty fast. It's pretty impressive hardware. It's got NVLink, which is like the NVIDIA technology that allows not just fast inter-GPU communication, but also between the CPU and the GPU. So that's, we're already seeing about a 1.7x improvement with uh, IBM Minsky compared to standard x86. Power 9. Uh, Power 9 is in the, like we've not had access to that machine yet, but once you port to Power 8, Power 9 is just. He's got his hand up, that's the last question. Uh, can I make use of this uh, GPU that is in memory application? Is that open as a practice storage? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, is that from a computer or is there, for example, in the use of some in memory application? Which means uh, when we do a save, it will not save that uh, this air was temporarily saving that. Um, so our, that's it's another one of those little bit trade secret areas. We have we we use the RAM, we use the cache, we use whatever we can get in the system. So some stuff might stay in the RAM, some stuff might stay in the cache, and it will be faster to operate on. But having said that, every piece of data that comes in gets stored almost immediately. Um, it's it's easy to do because it's a columnar database. You just append things to the end. In, in most situations, so it's easy to do that. And um, the in-memory situation is a little bit different because they have everything in the memory all the time, and we don't do that. We do offload data to disk and we read it as we as we need it. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Uh, Anon, Ami, and Joel are here for one-on-one -on -one questions right after the raffle. Um, if you want to talk to Ami, you got to kind of do it quick because he's he's got an airplane to catch. But they will be here for one-on-one -on -one questions. I want to give a great big round of applause for Ami and Ami. Alex, 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 Alex,